Welcome to Desire. We look at the designs of one Italian master, Armani. A luxury cruise on the Queen Mary. Drive in style in an Italian masterpiece or just hang one on your wall. Whatever your heart's desire. But first, if you're contemplating a luxury stopover in London, you won't find many hotels as accommodating as the Landmark. Voted the city's best hotel by the London Tourist Board, this heavenly haven is one of the last great Victorian railway hotels, constructed during the golden age of the steam train. During the two world wars it became a hospital and was bought by the present owners ten years ago, when it was extensively renovated and refurbished. From a business perspective, the London Tourism Awards are vital. They don't just look at customer service and the things you see front of house. They look behind the scenes at how an organisation invests in, it, in its product, the staff training and development, how they try and gain repeat business. So it doesn't just look at, at the bedrooms and the, and the furnishings, it looks at the whole organisation and the way it runs itself. General Manager Francis Green says the multi-million pound investment programme has paid off. Since we took over the hotel in August 95, we probably spent close to four million pounds on various renovations and upgrades, and that's going to be followed by another four million pounds coming and starting at the end of this month, which will go on for another four years. I mean, the costs never stop. We have a turnover in excess of 32 million, and we convert to about 47% of that down to profit. The bulk of our business is corporate individual travel, uh, which represents about 54% of our business. And of course, such quality doesn't come cheaply. Rooms start from £265 a night. The presidential suite is over £1,200 per night, but you do get the most up-to-date fax machine. During your stay in the bustling metropolis, you might want to take time out to savour the sweet aroma of English perfumery Penhaligons in Covent Garden. Steeped in tradition, Penhaligons made a name for itself way back in the 1870s, as the creator of luxury perfumes and bathing products for the more discerning ladies and gentlemen of Victorian England. Today, it's most famous for producing one of Princess Diana's favourite scents, Bluebell, and it still produces quality scents, soaps and talcum powders to the same traditional recipes. Products perfumed with traditional scents such as Violet, Elizabethan Rose and Lily of the Valley are sold for anything between six and 125 pounds. Penhaligans is unique. It's, it, it's English. Um, it's very, very luxurious and special in its packaging and design. We've always taken an approach that people would find us because ultimately people love something that's very unique and very special. And we have a global market of people who are fascinated and very, very loyal to Penhaligans and will travel the ends of the earth to find it. Sticking to the 19th century blends which made the company successful 100 years ago is not a bad business strategy, but it can make a company look old-fashioned and out of date, which is why Penhaligons has been careful to keep adding new products to its portfolio, a philosophy which has given the company a new generation of clients. While we want to hang on to our tradition of service, we're introducing a whole new range of fragrances that will appeal to a younger generation. Um, it, they, the younger people still appreciate what we have to offer, but they want something that's much more appealing to their lifestyle, and that's what we hope to offer them. And if you can't get to London, don't despair. Michelle Stewart's mission for the future is to take Penhaligon's sense to the rest of the world. The company has plans to open more shops in the United States, the Far East, Russia and Europe. And while you've got the credit card out, it might be a good idea to stock up on presents at Kensington's annual luxury gift fair. It's a quintessential British event where the traditional mixes merrily with the contemporary. Some 450 exhibiting companies show off their goods to shoppers, traders and the media. Over 30,000 people visit the fair over the course of its three-day run 
each with an average spend of just under a thousand pounds. From a business perspective, the show is invaluable to smaller exhibiting companies. It gives our company a lot more credibility to be at a fair because we're a mail order company. It's the only opportunity we have to be face to face with our customer. And even from a trade point of view, it's a fantastic place for buyers to see you. Um, I think there were 8,000 people here yesterday. And to have access to that many people in this confined space is a, a fantastic opportunity. However, getting a place at the fair is not easy. Only the creme de la creme of the gifts market are considered. We have a vetting committee who look at each application to exhibit here. Uh, we judge them on criteria of presentation, suitability of product, and also whether their range suits the expectations of the visitor. And of course, we're looking at unashamedly the luxury end of the market to meet the expectations of the AB1 consumer who'll be here. And whether you're in pursuit of that ultimate gourmet experience or just looking for that gorgeous little something for the loved one that has everything, organizers promise visitors to the fair won't be disappointed. Coming up, Giorgio Armani. If all that London shopping leaves you feeling hot and thirsty, why not skip over to Italy for a vodka on the rocks with a difference? Based on the Ice Hotel in Sweden, Milan's Freeze Box offers a corner of Lapland near the Mediterranean, with ice glasses, an ice bar, ice tables, an ice sofa, even ice lights. Made of 50 tons of crystal clear ice carried from the River Torn 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, the ice bar offers a new take on dressing up for the evening. The refrigerated room is kept at minus 5 degrees Celsius and visitors will only be allowed to stay in for half an hour. Partly to let as many people come through the bar as possible and partly to avoid frostbite. You know, this, this is pure ice directly from the river. We are harvesting this ice in uh, March every year, February, March. And then we are making uh, such blocks or uh, ice glasses from real ice from Torne River. After six months, it will be time to rebuild the bar from ice already in storage in Milan, and more blocks will then have to be harvested from Lapland. The ice will be worn away over the months as people touch the ice and their breath starts to melt the thick, clear blocks. 